in these weeks leading up to Easter. We are with Jesus in these last few days before the cross. And these symbols and images that we saw in John's vision in the revelation of the Lamb slain and the victory of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords over what is evil, what is wrong in the world. We are seeing in real time what that looks like in Mark 14. How those who are close to Jesus in these days are seeing the truth that is in these symbols that is taking place in Mark 14. And I want us to keep rooting these difficulties and challenging pictures that we see in John's revelation over recent weeks. I want to keep rooting them in the gospel events as Jesus goes to the cross and all these images that are sourced, sourcing John's vision of Jesus going to the cross. Um, I want to keep rooting these in the gospel and particularly in Mark 14 here. In chapter 14, we are close to Jesus through those who are closest to him in these last hours before the events of Good Friday and the resurrection on the Sunday. And I am trying to get into the heads of those around Jesus as they see what's taking place. How are they responding to Jesus as he is becoming what John will speak of when he speaks of the lamb slain as the one who brings victory over death and evil? How does that happen for those who are around Jesus? What is going on in their heads and in their hearts? And maybe we can be there with them a wee bit and, let, and feel that change taking place and think, what does that mean for me today? First thing to say in that, of course, is that it's, it's almost impossible to work out what's in other people's heads. I mean, I, I find it difficult to work out what's in the people around me, what's going on in their heads. Never mind going back to the disciples at this distance. It can be confusing reading people and understanding what's going on inside. Um, it's not going to be simple to feel the change that the disciples are going through in this last meal that they're having with Jesus. But one way that I think uh, to approach this is through uh, the objects that we spoke about earlier, and one in particular that I didn't raise at the time. Here's a domino, a domino set. Okay, I want to bring a domino set into play here. And these come, this set, it comes from a lovely old man in, in Motherwell, a sister, um, when he died. Nice ones, aren't they? Quick smart ones in there. When he died, his sister wanted me to hold on to these as a way to remember him. Sam had been a joiner. He'd worked in the Glasgow shipyards. He helped to build the Queen Mary. And he'd been a deacon in Motherwell Baptist Church since 1946. He was stalwart in the church. And um, a wonderful man. And the dominoes are there. And they've been with me since since he died. But since the autumn, they've begun to hold a more living meaning as well. My dad hasn't been well since the summer. And when he got back in the autumn from the hospital, he was struggling to be able to do much. And Jonathan and I started to go over and with these dominoes, with these very dominoes, and to play dominoes with him, he couldn't really do much, much else. It was one of the few things that he could do at that point. And what had simply been been a sort of remembering, became a living symbol of a new relationship, something new happening. The object of the dominoes has come alive with new meaning. It's no longer simply Sam's box of dominoes. It's now also significantly the box of dominoes that my dad, my son, and I played with when it mattered. It's changed, it's developed, it's grown a new significance. And if I'm trying to be where the disciples are as they gather around the table here on Thursday evening and eat and drink, that deepening and living engagement with the symbols that they know of is a way in. This is a Passover meal. Jesus has organized that it carries symbols of bread and wine. There's also dipping of bread into bitter herbs. These objects carry much meaning. And for those around Jesus, there is already deep meaning in them, ones of, of, uh, of pain, slavery, of a lamb slain, of escape, of exodus, of victory over freedom, of freedom from slavery, of committing to living in a different way, of not forgetting the gift of God and bringing us out of slavery into freedom. All these are in this meal, in these objects, in the bread and the wine already one way or another. These meanings are remembered in the bread, in the wine, in the dipping of bread and bitter herbs as they gather around this table on this Thursday evening at this Passover meal. But Jesus is going to deepen the meaning of these 
He's going to identify with himself. He's going to identify as the lamb slain through the wine. He is going to identify with the exodus gift of God and bring his people to a new freedom and a new victory over what is evil, what is wrong, what is destructive. Jesus is going to make these objects, which already carry so much meaning, he's going to deepen and extend them and say, I am bringing this to you now. He is the one who is making the promises of God new in this moment and opening up a new exodus moment for those who are around the table, but also for each one of us through the cross and the resurrection. What is made in the symbol here in the bread and the wine? In a few hours' time, will be made full through the cross and the resurrection. Jesus will be the lamb slain who brings the promise of the new covenant that is present in the wine at the table. And I want to focus on that specific symbol of the wine where Jesus speaks these words, this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many. This meal that Jesus is sharing and the disciples are sharing is a Passover meal. It's part of that joyful celebration that takes place where people remember the Exodus, where God drew his people out of slavery in Egypt, brings them to a promised land that is deep in meaning. And it's also part of the grain harvest, celebrating the first fruits of harvest, the joy of what is to come. And there are millions coming into Jerusalem for this a few years after these events. Um, as noted, there are three million, three million that come to Jerusalem in Roman records, three million that come to Jerusalem to celebrate this, this feast. That's over half the population of Scotland pouring into Jerusalem. It's massive, massive celebration. And in Exodus 13, as Moses is bringing the people out of slavery, this is what he says about this Passover meal, what you're doing. Moses says to people, remember this day, commemorate it, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with mighty hands. Eat nothing containing yeast, speed of the the traveling out of, of slavery. And it's the lamb slain that is at the heart of the way that Jesus is drawing all these deep meanings of freedom in Exodus of this act of God bringing his people into a new freedom. It is in the wine and the symbol of the blood where Jesus is opening up this new thing, putting new life into these words and symbols through the picture of the lamb slain. When Jesus speaks of the blood of the covenant in relation to the wine, he's pointing to a moment in the Exodus journey when with Moses there is a pause. When the crowds of God's people have come out of Egypt are paused at the foot of Mount Sinai and God is making a way for them. He is providing them with a way forward, with the path and the life to the promised lands. And embedded in that is a promise that God makes between himself and his people, covenants. And the words of that way of God are shared with the people, those who commit to the ways of God. And the covenant is made, the promises are made between God's people and God. And those promises are confirmed by the sacrifice of a lamb slain whose blood is placed on the altar for God and on the people. This blood confirms the commitment of the promises made at that point. And then what happens in Exodus is Moses then takes the blood, sprinkles the people, says, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. And then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, they go up and have a meal with God. They share a meal with God. They saw God, they ate, and they drank. And here is Jesus now sitting and drinking with those who are closest to him. And he speaks of the blood of the covenant. And a new making of covenant that is now taking place through his blood poured out. There is a deepening, a new moment with the wine. Jesus takes it, takes the wine, identifies it with his blood about to be poured out on the cross and says, this is the blood of the new covenant covenant what is going on and the glorious thing going on in all of this is this that God has given words of a new promise a new covenant coming one that recognizes the failures of the people to live to the promises of the exodus all these people gather around Mount Sinai as they move on they're not going to hold to the promises of God they're going to fall they're going to lose it they're not going to be able to do what they've promised to do. And God promises a new covenant where he says, I will make a new way for you. 
I will make a new covenant, new promises that will hold true because it's me that's making it, God says. I will make these promises and hold you despite your faltering hearts, your faltering steps. Jeremiah, he's spoken of this new covenant in the midst of all the war and the exile. He says this, this is what the Lord promises. Days are coming, but I will make a new covenant, a new promise with you. It's not going to be like the covenant I made with, with your ancestors when I took them by the hand, led you out of Egypt. Because they broke it. They broke it. This is the covenant I will make now with the people of Israel. I'll put my law in their minds, write it in their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they'll all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. He says, looks on those who are at Mount Sinai, those who have broken their promises, those who have faltered in their steps, and says, I will still hold you. My promises will stay. This is the covenant that Jesus is now identifying with his blood, that this promise of God in Jeremiah is now taking place. And that as the lamb slain, his blood affirms this promise of God, that you are now his people. The law of God is written in our hearts where our sins have found their forgiveness and lie will lie forgotten at the cross. When Jesus says of the wine, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, all that meaning of the Passover meal, of the exodus, of the escape from slavery, of the gift of a new life, all that escaping from the bitterness of being bound by others, this gift of God's freedom against the pain and sins of slavery, all of that is being affirmed and honored and blessed. But also all the failure and sin and loss of the people since those days at Mount Sinai is now also being taken up. Christ has taken up the wanderings in the wilderness, the failures of kingship, the pain of exile. Christ is taking up the sufferings of this moment and saying, what you are not able to do, I will do through the cross. And this is the blood of the covenant, the promise that I make. You will know me in your heart. I will forgive you and remember your sins no more. The cross is my promise to you. And the disciples will drink the wine. And they will go out into the darkness. But as they do, they will sing from the Hillel Psalm. Psalms 113 to Psalm 118. And this is how Psalm 118 ends as they're making their way into the darkness. As they walk towards Gethsemane after the meal, these are the words they're singing. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. It is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Be glad. Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made his light shine in us. You are my God. I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. And they walk into Gethsemane. And I pray we'd also give thanks that God's love in Christ, endures forever. All the failures and sins and turnings away that came after these promises spoken in Mount Sinai, Christ has taken up all these failures, all these sins, including ours, carried them to the cross, and his enduring love holds you now. The promise of all of this is held in the cross, and the blood of the Lamb slain, the one who yet lives, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is who 
we worship. Shall we pray?